Hey, welcome in everybody to the Sports Fanatic News Hockey Team Preview Show. I am Joe Borick, joined by a very special guest, John from Off the Wall Hockey, as we are going to preview the Boston Bruins you can see today. How are you doing today, John? I'm doing good, Joe. Thanks for having me. Really happy to talk some Boston hockey here. Yeah, and uh, you also have, uh, we'll give a shout out to you, uh, uh, podcast. I followed it on YouTube, but I can't quite remember the name of it. You're going to start doing for the Boston Bruins. And what is that so the listeners can know? Yes, uh, Black and Gold Weekly. It's a new uh, Boston Bruins show I'm going to be doing starting in January. And it's just going to be all Bruins' biggest topics and opinions of the week. And uh, those should be coming out on Fridays starting in January. And that's going to be a two-hour coming out at night, like a nice, long, uh, extensive uh, show, right? Uh, Going for between some around an hour to an hour and a half per show for that one. Cool. Cool. Yeah, that's going to be awesome. I definitely uh, check that out uh, to stay up on news on teams around the league. I like watching people I like um, for every team, basically, uh, if I like every someone for every team. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So... But anyway, we'll dive right into it. Um, A guy I want to ask you about off of the bat um, that I like as a youngster, but you being a big uh, bees guy definitely would have more insight on. Uh, Jack Stanika had a very good season with Providence. What do you Mm -hmm. think on his uh, projections and where he's going to suit in a lineup in the NHL in the future? Uh, I'm very, very high on Jack Stadnika. He is Boston's best prospect. There's no doubt about that. He lit it up in the AHL last year, and I think he has a chance to take a roster spot starting as early as this season. Uh, we saw him, you know, towards at times last season in the regular season when guys were out, he would be a guy that would fill in and get a call up. And we saw him up with the big club in the in the bubble during the postseason. Um, and I think Stadnika could steal a job as a forward in that lineup uh, this year, especially starting the year with Pasternak out on that right side, who's currently injured, recovering from surgery. Um, there, there's going to be a hole there, and I think Stadnik is definitely a guy that could fill in. Long term, I think he's your David Krejci replacement in Boston. Um He'll probably play wing to start his NHL career. The NHL games he has played, he's played wing. But he is a center, naturally, and down in the AHL has been a center. Um, And I think long-term, he's probably David Krejci's replacement as your number two center for the Bruins and could potentially even be a number one guy maybe down the road in the prime of his career. Yeah, which that would obviously be huge because you got a second-round pick that then ascends as your Bergeron Mm -hmm. replacement to not just your Krejci uh, replacement. So that would be a major acquisition. It already will be a major acquisition if he replaces Krejci, Uh, but it would be a very major acquisition if you're able to get a top-line center. And the Bruins uh, obviously have been uh, picking the young guys good because another guy that's going to have to make a big impact, and I believe he will, and I'm sure you do as well, is uh vodka vodka nine and i always say his name wrong but Mm -hmm. um he's a guy on defense that's another guy they're both 21 year old kids that are gonna have to make a bigger impact um because of obviously older guys being injured to start the season you got more shand out you got pastor knockout so that's why Shanika got a good shot to make the roster and um, Vaca Nine obviously is going to make it because you lost Tory Krug, and as of now, Char is no longer on the Bruins. So, what do you think of his projections uh, going forward as probably being a top four defenseman to start the season if all goes well? Uh, yeah, Vaca Nine is an interesting guy. I've gotten to see him a lot down in the AHL. Um, there's definite def- defensive deficiencies in his game, but obviously, he's still very young and still developing. Um, there's a lot of offensive upside there. He's a really good skater. He can move the puck. He's definitely an offensive defenseman. I don't know how much you're going to see him in the NHL this year. Um, they're looking like they're probably going to go Grizzly more and maybe Zaboral gotcha. on the left side or Vaka Nining could maybe take Zaboral's spot. And there's still the chance that Char comes back and plays on that bottom pair kind of as a 6-7 type role. Um, Boston does have about $3 million in cap space, so if they wanted to sign Char to like a one-year, one-year $1 million deal, um, that's definitely something still on the table. 
Um, but they're certainly thin on the left side of that defense now. With with Krug gone, you're never going to replace that offense with one guy. And with Chara potentially not coming back, all of a sudden that left side defense is totally different than what we've seen over the last couple of seasons. So Vakaninen maybe comes in and has a huge camp and, and gets to gets to play a, a significant role on that left side. There's certainly spots available there. There's also going to be some other defensemen there fighting for those spots as well. John Moore wants to keep an NHL job. Um, Zaboral's a guy that they just re-signed. They drafted in the first round in, back in 2015, and he really hasn't made the NHL yet. So no, he's yeah, going to be... Exactly. He's going to be fighting hard for an NHL spot. Um, and then you've got Lausanne and Clifton who are right shots, but I'm sure they'd be willing to switch, move over to the left side um, if it meant you know getting to play a, a shift at the NHL level. So um, there, there's a lot of defensive depth there with Boston, but not necessarily good defensive depth. It's more like there's a lot of young guys and we're not sure what they're going to be at the NHL level, and we just have to kind of wait and see and which ones stand out and which ones don't make it. Yeah, um, I think uh, Zaboro hasn't made the NHL yet. He's shown in the AHL he had a uh, round, I think it was a 20 or some point season last year. He seems now maybe if he just becomes that good, solid defensive guy that can give you some um offensive production chipped in because he's not going to be the all-encompassing guy I don't think at this point unless if something no. really gets taken to the next level that was once thought of him when he got drafted I think at this point it's more some offense with the very good defense is probably what you would want to see from him going forward because as a top first round pick. Um, he's good at that's still pretty good if he can become basically eventually in time a mini, say, fourth defensive version of like a slave. And that's where he's instead of a first pair, he's basically just a very good defender that you don't want to put on your first defensive line, but you're very comfortable having on your second. That would, I think, be a good ceiling that would probably make your fans still pretty happy with. Zaboro and uh, like that pick all these years later. So that where, yeah, Vaca 9, and I guess I see what you're saying. You don't want to force a kid up that's a little bit iffy on the defensive end, but good on the offensive end when you don't need to. That makes that, that definitely does make sense to me. I was just saying more with the way they lost Krug and Chara, I thought there was a chance he had a better chance he could make an impact because. It depends how much bank you're putting in uh, Grizzly, where for you, McAvoy is probably the number one guy. Or oh, yeah. yeah Ma okay. McAvoy yeah. is their number one guy now, without a doubt. Yeah, because I would say you have McAvoy, Carlo, Grizzly um, as your three locks that are in there. Then you're between Lazan, Miller, um, obviously John Moore, like Clifton. you said, Zaboral, Vakanine, and Clifton. Yeah. Yeah, that, there, uh, there's that, depth there, spots yeah. up for grabs there. So th those guys, someone can come in and win a job. Vakanayan has a chance to come in and win a job. Zaboral has a chance to win a job, but they're going to have to earn it because th there's so many guys there fighting for those spots that you're going to have to earn it and, and go in and steal that job from somebody else. Yeah, and I think a big thing for um, Boston, since they have some extra money, is getting, I think getting Chara back for a cheap tag would be a huge thing just to add more. He obviously Chara's not what he once was, but he's 44 years old. So you're not going to be once you once were at 44 years old. That would be pretty damn impressive if you yeah. were. Um, so uh, he's a still a very good, solid defenseman that just gets it done and is great for young guys. So I think he would still be a perfect guy to bring in. That definitely strengthens up your defense more and then gives you more of an overall foundation with having then a McAvoy. You have, obviously, a guy in McAvoy that replaces Krug. You have Carlo, who you think is probably going to jump back up from last year's um, good, not as good overall season but i think he's still a great defenseman you kind of have three proven guys at that point and then grizzly who they're making into a proven guy 
So then you could go, can then have four proven guys if Grizzly continues to develop rather than three and then guys that you're continuing to kind of tweak into being better at the NHL level in the Kevin Millers and the Lazans that you're hoping actually can be good fourth li- or third line defensemen, excuse me. So that's why I feel like Chara being in just kind of gives you more of a foundation back there that you're a little bit more comfortable with. But Yeah, I, I'm not again I'm not opposed to bring Chara back on a cheap deal. He's not even close to what he once was. He's very clearly a number six or number seven guy at this point. If he's in your top four, you're in big trouble on the back end. Um he but he can still kill penalties. He's very, very slow, but he can still kill penalties. And and he can play a depth role on a team and be a good veteran guy to have in the locker room. Um, so I'm not opposed to bringing him back. Grizzlick's a guy that's going to have to really step up this year. He's kind of been behind that Chara Krug tandem for his entire NHL career. Um, kind of buried on that third pair. Uh, but he's got a lot of offensive upside. He is an offensive minded defenseman and he's now going to be up on that top pair playing with Charlie McAvoy. So I think you're really going to see a a big jump forward from Grizzlick this season. And he's going to start to put up some real numbers offensively because he's going to have to, he's the new top offensive guy for the Bruins now. Um, you know, Matt McAvoy is right there, but McAvoy hasn't really put up the offensive side of things as much as he has the defensive side of things. Carlo is strictly a defensive defenseman. I'd like to see some more offense out of Carlo, but he's he's never going to be a big point producer. He is your prototypical shutdown defensive defenseman that you put out there against the other team's top players and just hope, you know, play in his own zone and, and not let those guys score. But you're never going to see big point totals from Carlo, I don't think. It's going to be Grizzly and McAvoy now with crew gone to put up the points from the back end for the Bruins yeah yeah I agree with that they definitely need a guy like Maddie Grizzly to um, step up one position you know you're definitely not questioning um, with the Boston Bruins um, is with Yaroslav Halak and Tuka Rask in mm-hmm. net you know you got a good goalie tandem and one of the best ones uh, in the league uh, there in a season that's going to have a lot of back-to-backs. Um, so that's a good pairing to have there, and I'm sure you agree that that's probably one of the top five or so pairings in the league coming into this season, I would say, off the top of my head. Yeah, absolutely. There's no question about that. I mean, the, the last two years, this duo of Rask and Halak have been absolutely phenomenal, particularly in regular seasons. Um, where they Boston's been one of the top three defensive teams in the league for the last few years. Um, and the, as far as goals against go, I believe they led the league in fewest goals against last season. So, um, but Boston's defense to me, their goaltending is not a question. Their defense is now with some yeah. of those guys gone a little bit more of a question, but uh, you've got to two, two, one of the best goaltending tandems in goal. Uh, with the Bruins so that certainly is something to to look forward to heading into this season yeah and I think Halak um, stepping up obviously uh, in the postseason as well but he's done that in the past Mm -hmm. has shown at times the ability to make the big saves as well when his defense has for lack of a better word collapsed on its uh, self Mm -hmm. so I think having him paired with Rask, who obviously has shown the abilities to do that over the years, always being amongst the top seven and some change for Vezina candidates usually. So uh, that's going to be fine there. It's just you're still going to need defense to step up in time to go as far as you want to go. So that's that's exactly the key there. But moving on now into the offensive department before we give our predictions on how things could go right and all that good stuff. Who do you think is going to step up for the Pasternak and Marchand um, missing those two guys for at least the little first little bit of the season? Yeah, um, there's a lot of pressure on Jake DeBrusque now 
because he's one of your best. If you take Marshan and Pasternak, who are clearly the two best wingers on that team, out of the lineup, DeBrusque then probably becomes your focal point as far as scoring goes. Um, so they're going to need Jake DeBrusque to take a big step and and show that he's going to be a 25, 30 goal guy in the NHL. He's just got a new contract. He had a very down season last year, was not all that impressive. So um, I, I want to see a lot more from Jake DeBrusque this year. And the new guy, Craig Smith, I mean, he's he's a seasoned veteran at the NHL level now. He's played in Nashville for years. Uh, he comes in as a free agent. He's been a consistent 20 or so goal scorer every year. And coming in on a right side where Pasternak's out to start the season, there's going to be a, a lot on Craig Smith's shoulders to kind of, you know, be a scorer right away and start and put the puck in the net until Pasternak comes back. And he's more of a depth guy, but he's going to be playing higher in the lineup than he normally would be with Pasternak out. So, DeBrusque and Smith, I think, are really going to have to, um, you know, shoulder a lot of that scoring load while Marshand and, and Pasternak are recovering from injuries. Yeah, Craig Smith's always been a player that's uh, been really fun to watch in his career while I was down there in uh, Nashville. One of those players that you want to have on your team that just works hard from being a ladder round uh, pick uh, to becoming a very consistent player. NHL producer, so uh, he definitely knows how to come from being a fourth or later round pick and is great for the young guys you have, like the Sonicas of the world, uh, mm -hmm. the, the Bruss of the world, to really be able to help them see everything and kind of know how to move past the tough times, which and is kind of what Jake DeBrusque found himself in last year with all the skill he has. Uh, everybody goes through the little downtimes in their careers. Um, and the, uh, the thing with Smith is how consistent he's been throughout his entire career. He's been an extremely consistent player. You know what you're going to get from Craig Smith. And that's kind of been the opposite of Jake DeBrusque. DeBrusque is so streaky and inconsistent where he goes through these stretches where he looks like he's going to be a superstar and then he'll not score a goal for two weeks. And he's just hot and cold, hot and cold, hot and cold. I think he's going to benefit a lot from a, a guy like Craig Smith, who's been such a model of consistency. Yeah, yeah, I think exactly. That's why he's going to be a great guy. You bring him in for the young guys. And I think that's a big key to why bringing back Chora will be key when you have these young defensemen coming up. But if not, you're going to have to see a guy like McAvoy take a much bigger leadership uh, role for the departure of Chora. Mm -hmm. Um, but now I think the next best two questions to ask are for everything we'll start with, cause it's always best to, before we make the predictions end with the positive. So we're starting with the bad for things to unfortunately not go right for the Bruins this year. What would have to take place and what do you think would uh, lead to that? Uh, for, for the Bruins to really tank this season um, and, and really have a bad year, I think you'd be looking at two main culprits. I think on the back end, these young guys just wouldn't be able to shoulder the, the load of what they're going to be put under now with Krug gone. Um, and I think there's a chance, you know, if things go really bad, that defense could just kind of crumble um, because just too much pressure would be put on players who aren't ready for that kind of role in the lineup yet, whether that's at the top of it with, with guys like Grizzlick and Carlo and McAvoy, or whether that's the depth guys. They just, if those guys in, in those depth roles aren't really ready to play and, and can't perform at a high enough level, then you're not going to have enough depth on the back end to win this season. And that could really tank Boston season. And the other thing I think would be lack of secondary scoring. Um, we hope that with the addition of Craig Smith, that really isn't an issue anymore. And also hoping that Anders Bjork can take another step forward and score more than he did last season. Um, but we saw during the postseason last year, secondary scoring become a huge issue for the Bruins, particularly in the Tampa Bay series. If it wasn't Marshan, Pasternak, or Bergeron, nobody was scoring for Boston. So secondary scoring has been an issue for them. They've been a very top-heavy team, reliant on that top line. Um, obviously, Marshan and Pasternak aren't going to be there to start the year. So you already need to rely on some other players than those guys to start this season. And, um, you know, we're hoping that Smith and Kasha and Richie and 
um, DeBrusque, Bjork, these guys can kind of build up that secondary scoring. Um, but if that doesn't happen, then that could be something that really tanks the Bruins as well. Yeah, um, I'm pretty much right with you on that. That's I was going to say their defense and um, lack of depth to start with, especially the two key injuries of mm-hmm. Pasta and Morshin could be what ends up um, biting them in the butt. But uh, now we'll move to the positivity. What would need to happen for Boston to be usually exactly where they're at, but in this tough new East division in the top four is what you have to be in to um, mm-hmm. make the playoffs. So what is going to happen for that to happen? Yeah, for, for Boston to really be at the top of that division and be a, a top contending team again, um, they're obviously going to have to get great goaltending. Rask and Halak are going to have to be the Rask and Halak that they've been the past couple of years. And Boston's going to have to be right up there with you know the best goaltending in the league. They're going to need those young defensemen to really step into those new roles and and excel in those new roles and take that that uh that team as far as they can go and and you know kind of minimize the loss of Tory Krug as much as possible and they're going to need secondary scoring you know pretty much the opposite of everything i said for what could go wrong for the bruins this year if those things go right then this team has a chance to be a contender and, and a top team once again um, if those, you know, these secondary scores do step up and Smith has a 20 goal season and Kasha scores more and Richie maybe at least puts up 25 points, then you're going to, I think, see Boston be near the top of that division again. And they're going to look like the Bruins that have been a consistent playoff team and consistent contender for the last few years. Yeah, yeah, I think they're going to be good. I think they're just going to do it a little bit differently. We've always seen them do it from the trenches, like I said before we started Mm -hmm. this video from building, from having their good defense that blocks a lot of shots, really kind of pisses you off and everything. And then you have that offensive production from your center core out to the pastas and Morshin on the wing, but didn't have as much depth production on wing. Mm-hmm. Um, that's what you hope to get more this year with the Craig Smiths of the world. Obviously, like you said, a Bjork stepping up more. Um, a guy that's really obviously fallen out of favor is a Zach Session type guy that hasn't been able to figure out. Yeah, I don't even think you'll see all. him in the NHL. Um, yeah, so... Uh, you have have all these guys in place that have to figure it out. Richie's obviously a great defender, never became the offensive player the Ducks hoped uh, when they drafted him, and now he's over with the Bees. But they got guys with some untapped stuff. Charlie Coyle's always been a good guy uh, to have, especially on your third-line center. So mm-hmm. you have still deep depth there, and then Seneca coming up. So I think they're going to be fine in their offense – compared with their goaltending is actually going to be what might carry them when everyone comes back this year, where usually you talk more about having a top heavy offense with the Bruins defense this year. If they really want to get to where they usually go, I think it's going to be their offense with their goalies just being studs like they mm-hmm. in Halak and Rask. And realistically, until I learned about him more last year, because he ended up being the backup in the playoffs. I didn't know much about Danny Vladar until I looked him up. He had a one something goals against average last year and won 14 and seven. He actually did really well. So they're actually three deep if he continues to do that well for Providence. Because if yeah. he continues to play as one of the best AHL goaltenders, usually that translates to something. So, yeah, he he actually led the AHL in goals against average and save percentage last season. Yeah, exactly, and that usually will translate to something. At mm-hmm. least for Yaroslav Halak, mm-hmm. let's say that usually can translate to somebody like that. So, yeah, I like their goaltender room. Of course, Tuka Rask. I think most people uh, like him. He was funny when he first came up uh, with his uh, reactions to things uh, at times. <laughs> Now he's, of course, a more mature dude. But, um, yeah, he's a great goaltender, and I think that's what's going to take him over the top. So to wrap up our video, I would say, what is your prediction for the Bruins ceiling now? We have a 56-game season, so I believe when I did the math before, I said that was 28 games, I mm-hmm. believe, is the uh, half point of the 500 mark there. So how many wins do you think the Bruins will have total this season to be able to get to the playoffs, I assume you think they'll get to. 
Yeah, I think Boston should be a playoff team this year. Um, I, I don't. They definitely took a hit with Krug leaving and having Marshan and Poshnok out to start the year, I think is going to hinder their season a little bit. I personally don't see them finishing at the top of that division. Um, in a 56 game season, I think they can win, you know, uh, 36 to 38 games, maybe even hit 40 wins this year. They're in a very, very difficult division. Um, obviously that East division, it looks like the group of death as far as the, the new NHL alignment yeah. goes. Um, I, I see them finishing, you know, probably in the high thirties win total and probably in the three or four spot in that division and in making the playoffs, but not being the, I don't think they're going to be the league leading team that they were last season. I just think the loss of Krug on that back end is going to really hurt and, and having Poshnok and Marshan miss time. Obviously, that takes a huge hit out of your offense, at least to start the year. Um, and with with a shortened schedule like this, you don't have as much time to make up for those losses at the beginning of the year. So, um, yeah, I, I still think they're a playoff team, but I don't think they're going to be that top tier contending, you know, favorite team that we've seen for the past couple of years. But they, they should still be in the postseason. Yeah, I agree exactly with that assessment. I would say they're around mid to low upper 30s, like 37 uh, type-ish, 38 wins, like you said. And I think in order to get up to that 40 or more mark, it's going to involve probably a trade Mm -hmm. in season to add somebody where you find your biggest weaknesses. So if guys on defense step up, they'll probably be at depth scoring. If scoring Mm -hmm. steps up and your defense doesn't, then that will be Mm -hmm. at defense. So whatever you find the need to fill, I think will be what will get you to that next level. But I will say, yeah, it will be exactly in that high to mid thirties mark. But thank you all uh, for joining us. Uh, Please like comment and subscribe. And of course, subscribe to John's channel of off the wall hockey as well. This has been the Sports Fanatic News Team Preview Boston Bruins Edition. Have a great, safe, and pleasant holidays, everybody. Peace out.